Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm Kylie Yoakum, and I like horses, obviously. But here we go. The blood runs hot and the thoroughbred, and the courage runs deep. In the best of them, pride is limitless. This is their heritage, and they carry it like a banner. What they have, they use. C.V. Anderson. Seabiscuit and Secretariat used all they had to their advantage. When they were winning, they showed their pride by winning big. Seabiscuit and Secretariat were also two of the greatest horses during their era. When, they, when a horse can give someone so much hope is when they become legends. Today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of horse racing, the two horses individually, Seabiscuit and Secretariat, and why you guys should care about two horses whose names both start with the letter S. <laughs> A little bit of history. According to Mike, Par Mike Parker, it began in about 4500 BC in Central Asia. It was a major sport between all major civilizations between Central Asia and the Mediterranean. And in the Olympics, Greek Olympics of 687 BC, it was actually a sport, which I thought was pretty cool. Today, it is the second most widely attended sport in the United States, followed behind baseball. And a fun fact is it's here because it's a cool way to go gamble. So I'm going to move on to the horses. Secretariat was, excuse me, Seabiscuit was born May 23rd, 1933 to Claiborne Farms. But he was smaller than the average colt and he wasn't really anything too pretty to look at. And he spent most of his days eating and sleeping. But he was brought up with a, like, with a good family background. His sire was Hardtack. He had promised to be a fierce competitor but he was bitter and mean, which kept him from being real competitive on the track. Actually, in one race, because of his bitter and meanness, he refused to leave the starting gate in a race, so they instantly <laughs> retired him, and he was acted as the stud at Claiborne Farms. His grandsire was Man of War. He was considered to be one of the best thoroughbred racehorses ever. He won 20 out of 21 races and made over $250,000 in the years of 1919 and 1920. <coughs> Excuse me. But Seabiscuit couldn't really do this on his own. I mean, he had a good team of Charles Howard, Tom Smith, and Red Pollard. First, Charles Howard became Seabiscuit's owner in 1935. He was an automobile entrepreneur, and if you guys drive a Buick, you can thank him for that. But he was kind of had some bad luck throughout his life. He lost his son, Frankie, at a really young age, which led to a divorce to his original wife. But then his buddies took him down to Mexico to go make him feel better, you know. And then he met his new wife, Marcella Zavala. And she got him back into the racing and took him, just took him out and let him have a good time again. And they met Tom Smith. Tom Smith was a Western cowboy from Wyoming. He was a trainer and farrier, but he had unusual training tactics, which seemed to work for the biscuit himself. But then while they were down there, they found Red Pollard. Johnny Red Pollard was originally from Canada and jockeyed up there a little bit, but he gained most of his experience racing in Mexico. But he was kind of down on his luck, too. If you guys don't know anything about Red Pollard, he was an oversized jockey, and he had to really watch his weight. So he was couldn't really keep a steady jockey position. But back to the biscuit. His size and conformation wasn't anything to be desired of for a racehorse. According to Mike Puma, he was barely 15 hands and 1,100 pounds, which is pretty small for a racehorse. And one of his one of Seabiscuit's jockeys underneath of Charles Howard's ownership. He said, George Wolf said, Seabiscuit's like a hunk of steel, solid, strong. You could kill him before he quit. But he wasn't always like that. When they bought him in 1935, he was 100 pounds underweight and very malnutrition. And it took a good year for him to get back onto his feet. So the team of Howard, Smith, Pollard, and the Biscuit began to have a little bit of success in 1936 and 1937. And that's when he became the most popular horse on the radio and the leading money earner which is pretty cool. And he's considered to be the best horse in the West. But the people wanted more at this time. They're like, cool, he's the best horse in the West. How about let's race him against the best horse in the East, which at that time was War Admiral, which leads to the eventual match of the century. And the really cool thing about this race was War Admiral was trained to break from the beginning and stay in the lead. And the Biscuit was always taught to um, work up the pack. So they had to retrain him in two weeks to break right away. And 
um, state of the league, so he could keep up with War Admiral. But, okay, right now Seba's kid is in the lead, and if you notice, they didn't use a starting gate. War Admiral hated starting gates, but he was such a fierce competitor that it, it didn't really bother him, you know, once he left. So, so they, they had to retrain him, like I said, and Seba's kid just has a cool story. Like, if they said if he ever had got a straight look in the eye of the other horse, he would never lose the race. And I know that sounds really corny, but it's true, because it's, it's just how he ran. Like, you'll see him take the lead in the beginning, but then he'll give it back, and you'll notice right here where they're head and head, this is the biscuit looking at War Admiral, like, straight in the eye, and being like, I'm gonna beat you, and you know this. <laughs> so I'm just gonna let the race run for a little bit here, <laughs> and then I'll show you where he takes him up. And they're still head and head. And this race actually took place November 1st, 1938. Right, we're on the back stretch now, and you can see where this gets trying to, you know, now he's whipping him up to get him back into the lead. And he ends up winning this race by four lengths. And they asked the jockey of War Admiral later if that horse could go any faster, and they said no. He was completely tapped out. And so the biscuit being the small little crooked legged horse won against the mighty War Admiral. And that's basically down the one. So, <clears throat> okay. so Seabiscuit ended up winning Horse of the Year the same year as War Admiral because War Admiral had previously won the Triple Crown and the Biscuit beat him, so they couldn't really decide who was better. So, on to the Great Secretariat. He was born to Claiborne Farms as well as Seabiscuit on March 30th, 1970. He also had a very good background. His sire was Bold Ruler, and he held his own in, in racing. He placed in all three Triple Crown races, which is pretty impressive for the most part. But his grandsire, Nazarula, has a really cool story. He's originally from Ireland. He won five out of 10 starts. And he was a good racer, but he was very temperamental, which they actually thought that he got, the secretary was the same way, and he got it from Nazarula. But like his uh, groom was the only one that could touch him for more than four seconds at a time, and if he didn't know you, he didn't like you. <clears throat> but Nazarula was shipped to Claiborne Farms in 1950 and was considered one of the most important sires of the 20th century. So you can kind of see it says the coin cost, and you realize, okay, what does horses have to do with coins here? But the ownership of Secretariat was based upon a coin toss between Ogden Phipps and Christopher Chenner. Chenner Phipps was in control of Bold Ruler, and so mainly his mares went to, went to Bold Ruler. But in 1968, they, um, Chenery brought two mares to Bold Ruler to get bread. And then when they flipped the coin, determined on who got first choice of the weanlings. Well, Phipps ended up winning the coin toss and picked a weanling that wasn't secretary, but it was out of secretariat's mom. So Chenery ended up with two colts, one of them including secretariat, and he wasn't even born yet. And he, I think he got the better end of the deal. And Secretariat had the perfect confirmation. I mean, he was given the nickname Big Red from the beginning because he was big, stout, and beautiful. And he had a good balance between speed and stamina. He had, he literally had the racehorse look growing up. He was long strided, had great bone structure. He was very strong and had a very proportional body. But his claim to fame were the Triple Crown races. And that includes the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness Stakes, and the Belmont Stakes. In the Kentucky Derby, he broke last and then gradually moved up the pack, catching his rival, Sham, and ended up winning by two and a half lengths and breaking the track record. The Preak mistakes, same thing, broke last, but he made the amazing last to first move by the first turn, which is impressive, and he still beat Sham, which is pretty cool. And he won by two and a half lengths and ended up setting that track record, too. The Belmont stakes, though, is what Secretary's most known for. And I'm gonna start a little bit in the middle, but it just shows, the beginning just shows Sham and Secretariat breaking out into the lead first. And this is just Sham and Secretariat here. Um, in the beginning, these two horses broke out and were, I believe, 10 lengths ahead of the rest of the pack. But as you can see, Sham begins to tire after six furlongs. And he ended up 
it becoming dead last in the race, but Secretariat just continues to build speed. Like he runs every quarter of a mile faster than the previous, which is just amazing at this point. And I'm just gonna let it roll through. <laughs> And then I believe at about this point, he is one sixteenth of a mile ahead of the rest of the pack. And it's probably approximately 12 to 14 lengths, give or take. Um, coming on to the back stretch, Sham continues to lose speed and loses his ambition because he broke so hard and couldn't handle the distance because the Belmont Stakes is the largest race of the Triple Crown. So, Cham's in the back now, and here comes Secretariat on the back stretch, continuing to build speed away from the rest of these horses. And in an interview later with his jockey, they asked, well, why did you just slow down? You had this one, they're like, I couldn't hold him back. He's just too powerful. And he ends up winning this race by 31 lengths, and broke the record by over two seconds. And became the first Triple Crown winner in 25 years, and the ninth horse ever to do it. So he was retired pretty young, like four or five, and then he was just acted as a stud after that, and he full of, or I guess he was bred to over 600 mares. He has over 600 colts under him, but none of them were ever as good as Secretariat, but that's basically impossible. <laughs> so now on to why should you care about these two horses? Really, Seabiscuit was an underdog. He was little, crooked, looked like a donkey, breathing problems, shouldn't have been able to run at all. And so, and he was literally the underdog. In the War Admiral and Seabiscuit race, he was the underdog two to one. So he really shouldn't have won. But then you have Secretariat, who's the winner from the beginning. But because he had great bone structure, he's very spunky, healthy, athletic, and he's predicted to be the winner. And I'm sure you guys all love the underdog story, you know, everybody coming up to the top, becoming the winner. But you also like the known winners, like Secretariat, because it's a safe bet. <laughs> <laughs> also, the time eras. Seabiscuit was born in 1933, right in the middle of the Great Depression. I guess the way I looked at it, people considered themselves to be the underdogs because they were in hard times. But when they saw the biscuit run, they're like, oh, maybe I am going to be a happier person later too. This guy's was. How about mine? You know, something like that. And Secretariat was born in 1970, you know, right after the Vietnam War, right at the end of the Vietnam War. And a lot of American lives were taken, and it was a stalemate war. It was you know, people are just like, oh, we're in a war, we're ending. I just lost my brother, so, you know, just stuff like that. But I would say that both these horses had the heart and drive to succeed. Red Pollard actually said, it's not in his feet, it's in his heart. So that proves that even the little guy that doesn't know he's a little guy can do great big things. And Secretariat had a little factor that nobody knew about until he died. He had a 22 pound heart which the average size heart's only eight to nine pounds, but it was very proportional with the rest of his body and it worked with him instead of against him. Because they previously found another horse with a 14 pound heart that worked against him and he didn't live very long. So literally, I guess you could say he had the heart to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> so today, I've told you a little bit about the history of the two horses in general and why I think you should care about them. When people watched Seabiscuit and Secretariat, they felt good about what they were betting on because they knew that they had the heart to win, literally in Secretariat's case, afterwards. But watching them was an adrenaline rush. Coming from behind and proving themselves makes them legends. Seabiscuit wasn't supposed to win against War Admiral, and Secretariat wasn't supposed to win the Triple Crown, but they did. They did what no <coughs> other horse could. So I'm leaving you with a quote. Courage is not about taking risks unknowingly, but putting your own, being in front of challenges, that others may not be able to. Thank you.